letting folks in. Uh, yeah, but you can let folks in. Where do you see that in, Mr. Uh, oh, you know what? I didn't see. I didn't make you a, a co-host. So I see the names. I definitely see the names here. What's this for? Oh. Let's see here. Block's supposed to be in here? Yes, yes. I'm going to ask everyone if they can please just uh, mute your mics. No, my bad. I was just asking. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. We should be in good shape. Uh, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I want to say thank you all for showing up um, to what we call unapologetic and proud. Uh, so I want to say two weeks ago, we had our first, uh, our first panel discussion. Uh, it was entitled Black Magic Baby. Hopefully you all were able to, uh, to show up to that. Um, but all year round, we've been all, all year uh, we've been uh, celebrating uh, Black Lives Matter, um, not week of action, but year of purpose here at Bradley Tech. And so in our ACP classes, we've been able to, um, you know, do different lessons and get different, uh, um, you know, learnings around the 13 principles of uh, Black Lives Matter, right? And so um, today, we put this panel together. We got some really cool folks from around the city uh, joining us today to kind of just pour into you all. Uh, for those of you all who don't know who I am, I know it's been a year of all virtual, so I probably haven't seen uh, some of you all. My name is Don Portis. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the community school coordinator here at Bradley Tech. Um, I know we got a date to come back in April, so I can't wait to see you all when we come back. You see me in the hallway, say what's up pretty cool person. Um, but this is not about me. It's about you all. And it's about uh, this conversation that we have prepared. Um, and so with no further ado, I would like to just what will do two things. I want to welcome our panel. But before we do that, um, I kind of want to share right like what this particular uh, uh, conversation we'll touch on, right? So we do have those 13 principles. Uh, and the two things that we are really going to focus on is love and engagement and just being unapologetically Black, right? And so what I mean by love and engagement is there's a commitment to embodying and practicing justice, liberation, and peace in our engagements with one another. And then that unapologetically Black piece is just being unapologetic and affirming that Black lives do matter, um, to love and desire freedom and justice for ourselves is a necessary prerequisite for wanting the same for others. All right. Um, and so our first panelist, we have Marquise Mays, who is born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, he's a director, a filmmaker, and a media scholar. He holds a master's degree from the University of Southern California uh, and a bachelor's from UW-Madison. Um, Marquise just recently put out two films um, that actually uh, premiered or showed at the Milwaukee Film Festival. Uh, and so we want to welcome Marquise Mays. So happy to be here. Thank y'all for having me. Um, thanks, Marquise. And we also want to welcome um, Jasmine Adams, uh, who's been a, a really like a longtime friend of mine. Um, but she is, I, I know I have here the Milwaukee Health Department, but she's actually um, at the Medical College of Wisconsin. She's a program director. She does something really fancy. I'm going to let her speak on it and not me because I don't want to mess it up. Thank you, Tom. It's really great to be here as well. 
Um, I'm a program director for the Department of Otolaryngology at the Medical College of Wisconsin for a program called Otoclonomics, which basically um, investigates through research and through external funding health disparities in Milwaukee and how we can close those gaps for people who look like me and you, um, for mostly black and brown people, since there's a lot that kind of goes into health disparities. It's not just the interaction with physicians, but also environmental factors that affect health. And so I'm bringing those to the forefront of conversation through um, research and through conversation and culture change within um, the healthcare environment. Nice. Thank you for joining us, Jasmine. Uh, some of you all may recognize this gentleman, right? So Edward Winger, right? It's an artist, a uh, spoken word artist, an educator, a youth worker, uh, and he's also uh, an alum or a graduate of Bradley Tech. So I want to welcome Edward. Yo, yo, it's peace. Am I muted? No, you good. Uh, yo, what's peace? Yo, thanks so much for having me. It's an honor. Yeah, I'm a most definitely a long Bradley Tech class of 2016. So there's some teachers. I know uh, when I was telling Ms. Borkin about that, she got really excited that you were uh, going to be joining us. She said hey, you, you, you owe her too, so. What I owe her? She gave me an F on you, purpose. <laughs> you you got to take that up with her. You got to take it up with her. Um, and I did all my work. Uh oh. Uh, but last but not least, we got Sam Ahmed, uh, to better known uh, in, in creative circles as Webster X. Uh, he's an artist here, an activist, um, you know, something that he just recently put together this past year, right, is uh, an organization called Black is Beautiful. Um, they put together a number of bike rides um, as, as a self-care response to uh, some of the things that were going on. Uh, outside, uh, so I want to welcome Webster to the stage as well. What's going on, y'all? What's going on? Let's do it. All right. Uh, and so now that we know our panelists, right? Like I want to actually want to stop sharing my screen just so we can have like a real, uh, a real, a real dialogue here. Uh, and so for the first question, I'm gonna pose it out to everybody. Uh, just kind of tell us about yourself, like your personal journey. Uh, what led you uh, to do the things that you are currently doing? Um, and I'm actually going to start with Jasmine because she's, she's the queen of this panel right now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I, my name is Jasmine Adams. I, how did I start? I went to Marquette through the Education Opportunity Program um, I started off in athletic training because I played sports majority of my life and I just had an affinity to, uh, to just be around sports. Um, I shortly was, after being in that for about a year and a half, I actually had to test into it and I was confronted with um, a very weird situation where I was called into the office of the director of the athletic training department and even though I had a passing, like passing grades, I had passed to get into it because I didn't test right into it as I went to Marquette. He stopped me and was like, you know, is this something that you really want to do? And I then knew from how he was posing that question to me was that he was saying because I was black. And um, it was a hard stop for me because at that point I was like, I almost want to do it just to prove that I could. But then I also didn't want to be in a space that I wasn't welcomed in. And it kind of helped me, it made me reconsider like the feeling that I got from that and that I didn't want anybody else to feel that way and kind of like what the sort of impact would be on a person who was trying to find themselves through college education and that whole experience, like what that looks like. I didn't want anybody else to feel like that. So I changed my major to psychology with the intentions of being a counselor after I graduated. I graduated, I actually got into um, Berkeley for their PhD program for the clinical psychology um, to be a psychologist. And I decided not to go, I have full disclosure, I have Crohn's disease. So it was super scary for me to move to California 
and not be around my family. I'm super, super close to my grandmother prior to her passing. She um, lived next to me, next door to me. So I wasn't really ready, I felt at the time for that. So I got a job in Chicago and I commuted back and forth and it was at Rush Hospital. I worked in pediatric oncology. So I worked with a lot of kids with cancer, only worked there for about eight months. And within that eight months, um, it was kind of like initiation by fire. I worked on this physician who was extremely passionate about um, black and brown communities, even though he was white. He was like, you know, I, I don't like the way that physicians like my peers treat black and brown people. I understand that it's a difference. And he was like, I'm hoping that through this program that you were hired through that you can establish the need for a sort of research program that focuses on this to normalize the sort of care um, and even the playing field, like the playing ground for black people and white people. And um, he was super passionate about it, especially because it was children too, right? So um, I did that, that kind of sparked my interest in medical research. Um, and so then I started working at MCW and in the emergency department as a pediatric um, research coordinator. That there's a lot of trauma that comes with working in life, like those two fields that I worked in, like in those eight months working at Rush, I lost like six kids um, that passed away from cancer. And then like working in Milwaukee and in the ER department on the pediatric side, that was, I mean, I don't have to say that it wasn't the best place to work, but um, I'm appreciative of those experiences because they kind of hardened me to understand the staunch reality of what um, medical care looks like for black and brown communities and how people in the medical field communicate about certain populations versus how they communicate about others and what the response is like. That sort of was a catalyst to my um, interest in public health. Um, on top of that, while I was in that position at MCW, that first position, I worked under a white woman who was the only woman in that department. Um, and I was the only black person in that entire department and the entire emergency department on the pediatric and the adult side in the professional field. And that was back in 2015. So between that experience professionally and my experience and working from under her, where it was kind of, she wanted to keep me right here. You know, she didn't want to do at MCW and other like organizations similar to that. Once you put in a certain amount of time, you automatically are moved up. And I never moved up in like the five years that I was there. And I realized now in retrospect, the other reasons why I didn't, even though I was offered a manager job, she didn't want to raise my salary, even though I'll be technically moving up like three positions, she wanted to keep me there. So real, recognizing those sort of power dynamics, I sort of want to challenge that. So then I decided to leave um, and got my MPH at Zilber, at UWM at Zilber School of Public Health. And that's a master's of public health. I'm gonna not use acronyms. I understand we are not supposed to do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I got a master's in public health and policy to try to affect sort of macro level change for black and brown communities in the health field. I wanted to be a lobbyist at first, but then there's a very evil world of lobbying that I don't wanna get into right now. <laughs> so um, after I got my MPH, I um, worked on at Community Advocates um, for about two years. And then I realized that I wasn't really going to affect the sort of change that I wanted to unless I was in a position of power. And I just started just putting myself out there. Like, I'm just gonna apply for director roles. I'm, I know I'm in my twenties, I'm just going to be a director. I'm going, I don't want anybody to be over me, like to do the type of things that I wanna do. So something stuck and I'm in this position now. I've been in it for a year. I went through, I'm still going through um, that whole, you know, doubting of yourself and everything. Like when you're in a new role, like imposter syndrome, I have that every day. I had it this morning when I woke up, like, am I, people are asking me these types of questions. And then, you know, I have to remind myself, like the only competition that you have is really yourself. And once you stop comparing yourself to others and where you're supposed to be in life, you'll be surprised at how far you'll get in chasing your own dreams once you sort of narrow that sort of vision. But I'm not gonna get into all that. That's just about me and I'm gonna stop talking. Thank you. <laughs>
no, I think that that was that was great. That was great. Um, Edward, I want to pass that same question over to you. Um, recent, somewhat recent, right? Uh, 2016 grad. Um, what what's your journey been like? Uh, if you could, especially like speak on like the time since you left Bradley Tech uh, to where you're currently at now. Um, Cause I, I want to say like your path is not like a lot of your peers. Um, so I just want to hear a little bit about. Yeah. So yeah, that. so it's most definitely wasn't recent. I graduated high school five years ago, 2016. I'm old, but um, my, my journey is, it's, it's been beautiful. You know, uh, the main thing that's, that's dope about it is that I've been able to step into my community, do some good work, do some decent work. And I'm still, I'm nowhere near where I want to be. Um, but like fresh out of high school, I uh, did public allies and I was working at NPS and I was able to, you know, do workshops with young people about their voice and implement it to the cent into the central office and really help them like understand what the young people really want really want and need. They already know it. I don't feel like too much has gotten done from it, but I personally feel like it was a good opportunity for me as far as where I'm at now and what I'm trying to do now as far as and continuing that work. And from there, I've been able to do workshops at Bradley Tech, which was which was mad dope. Like, it was mad dope to be able to work with a couple of young people fresh out of high school. I think it was like 20 young people fresh out of high school coming back to my high school to do workshops. And then from there, and, that, and those workshops was on resiliency awareness building. And then I came back to Tech to do some more workshops on about on poetry. I'm a creative junkie. Like literally, I love all things creative. I love all things creativity. And so it was amazing to be able to step into that, step into my element and do more poetry workshops. And then after that, I just been, you know, just being heavy on the on the activism and community work, um, volunteering, working with different organizations, continuing to do workshops. We're still doing poetry workshops right now with uh, Shorewood High School, you know. So my journey has been amazing, only because I've been able to do what I'm passionate about. I've been able to do what I really want to do. And especially without having to go to school, you know, like I tried to go to school a couple of times. It wasn't, it wasn't for me. I'm thinking about going back, but I don't know what that looked like because I got to do something that I'm really interested in. But I personally feel like just being, being in the rooms and the spaces that I have been in lately and the work that I've been able to do with young people without a degree, it's a blessing. It's most definitely a blessing for me. You know, but with all, I'm just grateful for the opportunity. And I'm grateful to be in a space where it's like, I can say, yeah, I came back to my high school to do more. I want to do more. The goal is the vision and ambition is going through me. I want to do so much more, but it's a process. Appreciate that. Um, it's in the chat, um, we have a staff member who's requesting, because we got a poetry club here at Tech. Uh, and so, uh, Ms. Steinbach, I can, I can put you two together. Um, but Marquise Webster, uh, I want to I wanna ask, same question, but I want to throw another like another wrench in there, um, just because you all, um, I would say like took expression, took two different routes to to your expressions, right? So uh, I want to, I kind of want to ask the same question, like what's the journey? How did you land to where you're at now? Uh, Webster, I kind of downplayed it a little bit, but he's a recording artist, right? Um, and I will say, uh, if we were to put up one, uh, what do they call it? Like a Mount Rushmore of like, you know, hip hop artists, right? From Milwaukee, I would definitely place Webster on that Mount Rushmore. Um, and so talk about your journey, how you got to where you're at, um, but specifically like Marquise, why did you choose the film direction? Webster, why did you choose uh, uh, rap or uh, music as, as your form of expression? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I'll start that off. Um, music came very randomly and very natural to me, right? So like the backstory of me is both of my parents are from Ethiopia. Um, I'm a first generation American. I grew up on the north side of Milwaukee and then I went to Wauwatosa schoolings from like K-4 up until senior year of high school. So like, I feel like I've always been in a lot of different bubbles of people, which is why I feel like I'm able to kind of talk to all kinds of different people. And then also now I see how that, you know, bleeds into my music, but Growing up, I never really wanted to really pursue a career as like a rapper, pursue a career in music at all. I was really just locked into sports, right? So like I had hoop dreams when I was growing up. Basketball was like everything for me. 
up until I was like, pretty much, you know, when I got cut J, uh, JV, that was like sophomore year of high school. And I was like, dang, like, and I took it super to heart because I thought I was going to the league. Like, you know, I had all kinds of just crazy visions. And then I started doing track and field in high school. And then everything kind of changed for me, my junior year of high school. So I had this teacher named Miss Kasdorf and I was in her poetry class and um, she assigned his poetry assignment to us. And again, like I was still in a phase of like not really knowing what I wanted to do yet at 17 years old. Right. And I took that assignment and I don't even really remember what it specifically was, but all I remember was the reaction when I shared it with the class and her reaction where she pulled me aside after the class let out. And she was telling me like, you know, you really do have something here. You have a talent here. You should try and explore more. She gave me some resources like right away. So that was like, I was like, okay, like, I don't really think anything of it after that, but um, I think my ego got struck maybe back then. And I was like, okay, maybe I'll just start writing some poems here and there. And like, I grew up listening to like, you know, all kinds of music, like psychedelic rock was some of the first music I listened to. Then obviously I listened to plenty of rap, like Midnight Marauders is my first album ever by Trap Called Quest. Like, and then 50 Cent Get Rich Die Trying was the first album I ever bought myself. You know what I'm saying? So like, I've just been in so many, just, I listen to everything. So then when I went to UWM, um, I went there from freshman to junior year and I dropped out my junior year. Um, freshman year was when, you know, like a lot of groups like Off Future, ASAP Rocky, a few other artists were coming out. But the biggest common thread that I noticed was like, they were all different and doing their thing. And it wasn't this like, it wasn't this boxed in idea of like what a rapper had to be, even though I love all the things that a rapper is like, the, the the essential rapper starter pack is that you know there's nothing wrong with it but it was it was an amazing thing to where it opened up more doors for people like myself who I feel like just is one of one you know I, I don't I just I kind of run I go to the beat of my own drum so then I started recording um and I started like laying down I remember my first rap that I ever laid down like, I, like the first time I ever laid down was this freestyle I had over uh Lil Wayne six foot seven foot because Lil Wayne was like my favorite rapper of you know all time um and and yeah and then from there kind of just kept snowballing but I think the biggest turning point was you know when I was I was a sophomore in college and I got my first house with my buddy Damien who was a person that's a lot of my uh videos he's an amazing filmmaker um we got this house, we threw a lot of parties that year. And what I wasn't realizing that I was doing, cause like in high school, I was such a chameleon that I didn't really like, I wasn't stuck to just a specific, you know, group of people, but also like, I wasn't necessarily the most popular, but I wasn't like not popular, you know, like I was just in the middle my whole life. Always. I just felt like I always was in the middle. And, um, but I noticed with me throwing all these house parties, like people that I thought were cool from like high school, they all would come and like, I'm like, this is just, my world is changing. I don't know. And I didn't realize I was building a huge social network by doing those parties. Like the police never came to the, you know, these, these parties to bust them or anything like that. You know, I was just being young and being 19. And um, after that junior year of high school was when I released my first song underneath Webster X and put it up on SoundCloud. It's called Desperate Youth. And I played like my first show by the grace of just chance. Somebody Facebook messaged me and was like, yo, um, I heard this song. You should come play this show. It was at uh, Landmark Lanes on the east side in the in the basement in the moon room. I know you know about that, Dom. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just remember the first show out gate. Like I just, I gave it my all. And, you know, it just, it was such a natural thing. And then the song started taking off on SoundCloud. It got like 25,000 plays after like a month. And I was like, this is working and school no longer became a priority for me because we got to remember I have immigrant parents who like, you know, they want security for you. They want you to, they came here to give you a better, um, a better way of life, you know? And I kind of was like, I'm not, I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be these things. I want to, I want to pursue art. Like I said, right. So like we kind of went over my trajectory. Uh, naturally things just place, but my biggest lesson, I think, is when something did fall into place, no matter what it was, I always wanted to go the extra mile with it. So if that was basketball, like that fell into place for me, I wanted to go the extra mile with it. Didn't work out. Cool. I'll move on. Track. Same thing. That was supposed to work out. I was supposed to run at UWM, but I just didn't want to anymore. You know, and music was the thing where like I, I became so obsessed with it. 
I never wanted to end. And that's how I still feel today at 28 years old. So, um, yeah, man, that's kind of that's kind of my journey. So it's, it's just all very just, you know, things naturally kind of fell into place. But I think I was always destined for music because now that I look at it, it makes the most sense of why I do what I do. You know, it's I grew up around a lot of different people. I spoke to a lot of different people. I have influences from everything. So, of course, I'm going to make art. And of course, thankfully, I can make some music. So that's me. Oh, that's what's up. I know they're telling you to freestyle in the chat. I'm a, I'm gonna say, no <laughs> no say no for you though, so you ain't they don't gotta hold it against you. I would get free bars, honestly. No, I was playing so good. You, YouTube, YouTube, Webster X. Um, but Marquise, I want to pass it off to you. That same question, uh, but also like specifically um, your creative expression going to film. Like, how was that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so similar to like a lot of people, I do think that like my journey to filmmaking was both like natural and kind of like also weird. <laughs> so I grew up on both the east side and the north side of Milwaukee. And um, I would spend a lot of my time going to Northtown. Uh, a lot of y'all probably don't know what that is, but Northtown Cinema, oh, 76. Um, used to go there a lot to spend way more time in the lobby than actually in the movies, but used to go there a lot. And um, around the time that I was kind of growing up, around you know 13 14 years old I started realizing that the city of Milwaukee was just closing everything down like they were closing down movie theaters couldn't go to the skating ring unless you had a skate ID um, couldn't go to the mall after 3 p.m so like all these things are kind of put into place uh, to kind of limit the expression of black kids um, when I was growing up in the city and the first thing that I put in my head was I gotta go I gotta get out um, of this place and around the age of 13, 14, I just, you know, I was always in pre-college programs, but that's when I really joined like a summer program where I would go to Madison every summer um, with a whole bunch of other kids from the city, a whole bunch of other black kids from the North side, the East side, <laughs> all within vulnerable neighborhoods and stuff like that. So I was in a people program, yes. Uh, and we went every summer and to get away from Milwaukee was both one, a savior, but then two, it made me realize what I was missing um, the most. And what kind of happened after that was I went, you know, ended up getting a full ride to UW-Madison from the people program. Um, and I went there and I was like, oh, I'm gonna be a journalist. I'm going to be like, I wanna be like on <laughs> ABC News. I wanna be the reporter. I wanna be the person that's on camera. And what happened was um, at that time, not only was I in school at UW-Madison, I was president of the Black Student Union there was also during the time when I was in college, the Sherman Park riots happened. Mm -hmm. Also when I was uh, at UW-Madison, uh, Tony Robinson, who um, is a young kid who was murdered at the hands of police happened in Madison, Wisconsin during my time at UW. And I just had an issue with objectivity. I had an issue with journalism because you, you're telling me a black man to my face that I have to be objective, that I got to see it from both sides when um, a lot of people who look like me don't even get to exist or live both sides. So I had an issue with that. And I was just like, what is a way that I can kind of, you know, express myself? Um, and that's kind of how I fell into documentary filmmaking um, as a source to be like, yo, my people are hella dope. Excuse my language, but my people are good people. Like, um, you know, and, and I, I wanted to tell stories about the people who raised me, about the, about the city that raised me the good, bad, the ugly, the unforgivable, but also the parts that are forgettable or for, forgivable about the city. Um, so that's what happened. And I went, you know, I originally went, UW-Madison is like a research school. So every time you go, you have to do like a big research project, you have to do a research project or whatever. And I was kind of nervous because I'm just like, y'all want to make films, but I had to do the research part. So I, um, I took, I took, you know, stepping out on faith, I took like, my junior year of college, I took a graduate level visual arts class. And when I tell you, I was in there with people who are 30 years old <laughs> with kids and full-time jobs who are trying to get their PhD. And I was just a 19 year old, 20 year old junior, just trying to take the class. Um, I didn't say nothing that whole time. I just observed that space. I didn't have nothing <laughs> productive to add. But at the end of that course, I came out 
you know, she started the course at the beginning in January, like, oh, everybody has to write a 30 page paper. Now, mind you, all the adults are like, oh yeah, I can do that. Like, that's, that's easy. I'm like, what, 30 pages? Like, I ain't even got that much to say. <laughs> so what happened was, oh, and then come May, I have 30 pages written about black film, black television, um, the history of black television, the history of black film. And that same paper, got me into the number one film school in the nation, USC, with a full ride. So you got to step out on faith, you got to step out on fear, because as soon as that happened, I go to USC and I wasn't like, I wasn't a production kid, right? You know, I'm sitting next to, the, you know, the guy that made Black Panther, Ryan Coogler, that's an alumni from USC. Like he graduated a few years before I like went there. So I'm sitting in class with people like, oh, you know, so-and-so, oh, you know, Regina King, oh, that's cool, you know, Janelle Monae, like, I'm just a Black kid from the city of Milwaukee, like, and I really doubted myself, um, didn't realize that being from Milwaukee was the best power and the biggest power that I, that I held. Um, I think I was kind of, I was in LA, and I was just like, all oh, these people are just so dope, what do I bring to the table, and then that's when I really got into telling stories about Milwaukee. That's when I started to call back home a lot. That's when I started to come back home a lot and talk to my grandma, talk to my best friends, talk to people that I haven't seen in years um, and kind of figure out what, what they're doing and stuff like that. So I ended up graduating from USC with my master's in cinema media studies. And um, because of COVID, I moved back home. And I think that was the best decision I ever made in my life because me being in Milwaukee for the past year, I could have been in LA. I could have still been there. I, had, I felt like I had so much more to do, but coming back to Milwaukee was the best decision I ever made. And I plan on being here for a while. And I plan on making films for a while because I think all that to say that like Chicago has their film, Detroit has their films, like, you know, like New York has their films, Atlanta has their films. What does a Milwaukee film look like? What does our films look like? How can we make that story for ourselves? So. I came back and I, you know, did a short film about my grandmother who's blind, you know, and she, she's been blind for about 26 years now. So pretty much my whole life. And um, I did a story about her, like, you know, being blind, how do you recount your history? Let's, let's bring in, you know, and I just started asking my homies, like, who know how to do animation? Oh, let's draw some of her memories. Let's like, let's just chart that history through animation, whatever. And then it led to my most recent film, The Heartland, um, which is not available to watch at the moment, but <laughs> the trailer is available. Uh, but The Heartland is uh, a love letter, um, a visual love letter to Milwaukee um, to remind us as black kids specifically that like, yo, we got so much love for this city. And although the city does not love us back sometimes, it is it is, it is such a true love for, for this place that you won't find anywhere else, no matter where you go. So. That's what I've been on, that's what I've been doing. And now I'm just back at the crib, kicking it with my parents, enjoying my time uh, uh, and just continuing to make films. Appreciate that. Thank you for sharing. Um, I do have a question I kind of want to, I want to focus it towards Jasmine and Webster. Um, and so Jasmine, you are in the public health sector, is that? Is that fair to say? Okay. Uh, and so I just think like health in general, like black folks, people of color, um, we have these uh, stigmas around like getting help, um, entering any health spaces, right? Whether it's mental, physical, whatever, like we just got this like, uh, like I don't really know what's going on. Uh, and so I kind of want you to, to to share, right? Like you are someone who is within that field. Um, like how how is that one? Um, and then to kind of tie it, Webster, um, the, the bike ride that you put together uh, this summer was kind of, like I said earlier, was like a direct response to uh, like some self, -care, some self care stuff uh, that was needed, right? Because we were dealing with, um, you know, the, the, just the murder of George Floyd uh, and not that that was like the one thing that happened that made all of this like energy uh, real, but like it was just kind of like one of those icing on the cake type of events. Um, and it, it just kind of made everybody just like stress levels like go super, super high. Um, and so again, Jasmine is just like, how is it working within the health field? And like, 
I guess, what responsibility do you have in kind of like dispelling like false perceptions and rumors around like stuff that happens to black folks and like people of color if they go into the hospital or go to the doctor uh, and then Webster just kind of like your thought process on like coming up with something like a bike ride as a response to what was going on outside. Um, so that is a huge responsibility to like sort of kind of touch on what I was talking about earlier about shifting the narrative and the culture within healthcare, um, specifically at Freighter. Um, since that is the only academic like research center sort of um, healthcare facility in Wisconsin, actually. Um, yeah, it is. So my role, like what I do is I kind of hold the physicians like accountable for that sort of thing, right? That's what my funding is mostly for through research and through like showing them through their clinical outcomes. Like, why is it that um, black and brown people see you less like what are you doing like or do you are you communicating well is there a cultural barrier um, which is another reason why I'm right now I'm applying for a grant that only recruits black and brown medical students to have um, this sort of experience this research experience a year-long experience that'll make them more competitive to apply for their residency program afterwards to try to expand the field of black physicians to get like up there, you know, their, um, their resume more, but being in it, it's hard because I have the experience of, I mean, I have, I have a complicated disease. I have a lot of interaction with, um, healthcare professionals in my personal life. I've had family that three people in my family have gone through cancer, my, including my mother and watched my mom, you know, be talked to like crap because they just think that she's not going to understand. And then using that experience to kind of um, inform my work and what I do and what I have the power to do and what I know to be a cultural fact versus like a research fact, like, oh, well, the numbers aren't saying, you know, that we're doing this, but I'm saying culturally it is, it is accepted on the physician side, I would say, and on you know the person receiving care who may not be white, that their experience is gonna be different, it's gonna be foreign and it's not gonna be a trusting experience. So my position, what, what, what I wanna do because I believe in science, science is very real to me, um, is to sort of normalize that for people of color through my sort of influence, like the things that I can do within my job and then outside my job. So a prime example would be COVID vaccine, right? I'm fully vaccinated. Um, after I got the vaccine, I realized like it's a scary thing because we feel like we're all guinea pigs, but this is happening throughout the world. Like it's a pandemic. It's not just happening to Americans who are just, the vaccine is only being offered to them. Um, once I got it, I realized that and that I was in a position of influence like within my social circles where I could update people like through my Instagram story and say, listen, it is totally your decision. I'm not saying you need to get this vaccine. I'm saying that I would encourage you to, but I'll document myself. And if I have, you know, side effects, I'll show you, like, I'm going to be totally honest and tell you, like, this is what it looks like for me. This is how I'm doing two weeks later and stuff like that. But that's just like a small case study. I feel like something like that, I try to use like within my social circles to like communicate that, yes, you are right and not trusting like the sort of patterns of, and the history of healthcare because there's clearly historical trauma that has been experienced and that we believe and that has been passed on. But at the same time, like some things are just hard fact and are real and we need to figure out what that looks like and like create those safe spaces for you know, to increase sort of like the cultural competence of physicians to understand that, you know, white health isn't the only health that matters and that health is a very dynamic thing to understand. Um, I hope that answers the question, right? Is that it? Yeah, no. Is there it, anything yeah. else? <laughs> no, I think the, the most tangible thing for me is like, I'm glad that you said like the, the Instagram story piece because 
like my, my mom calls me every day and be like, yo, make sure you go get your vaccine. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Like, I'm still kind of nervous, right? But like, you are somebody who, uh, right? Like we follow each other, like, you know, I can call, I can text. Um, and so like, I, I use the information from you as opposed to my own, just like, I don't know, right? Like, right. I wanna be able to tap into somebody who is an industry professional. Um, mm -hmm. and get knowledge from 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 you and you being who you are right like accessible somebody who's part of like the community that I'm a part of uh, it makes those things uh, real so no you answered it perfectly uh, Webster but yeah like oh sorry oh, my bad did I cut you off I had I had just one more thing to say so um where I, I grew up on what's now called Vell Phillips, right? It's 4th and Lloyd, basically like right off of MLK, like 4th and North, right over there by where the, um, what's it called? The Griot, they call it the Griot, right? Is like a block away. No, the, uh, the, the African-American the African -American Holocaust. Yeah, yeah. but the, on the sign says, okay, anyways, <laughs> the sign does say that. It, does, it is the Holocaust Museum, but um, I've had experience like growing up where people will come into that community and just like, I don't want to say like use us for data or try to, I was, let's just say exploit uh, us, right? And so I do understand, like, I don't, what I don't want to happen is that I get in a position of power and then I'm all suddenly looked at as like an outsider, like, I've, what I want the students to understand is that there's so much wealth and power in your experience and how you translate that to those around you. Um, and I, I think that Marquise pointed that out so eloquently, like that being from Milwaukee, there's so much power in that, like just from just our physical experience of like living here and the sort of things that we go through on a day-to-day -day basis and how segregated it is. I don't think you, we recognize it as normal, but until you go away and you come back, you realize how much power you have, especially at a young age that you, you know so much about the intricacies of society that a lot of people are sheltered from and don't have that sort of raw experience that we're exposed to. But that's all I want to say. Okay. Go ahead, Webster X. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Webb, I definitely want to give you space to touch on uh, the bike ride. We have a number of staff members who, who bike pretty often. Um, and so we, we talked about it during the summer. Like we talked about it, like, are you going, are you not? Um, but if you can just kind of like give give like the backstory or the the like the origin story to the to uh, Black is Beautiful organization and, and bike ride. Yeah, man, uh, it's a story. Um, all right, pandemic, right? Ahmad Arbery, Breonna Taylor. That happens in like January, February, twenty twenty. Kind of goes under the radar. George Floyd happens, everything gets bubbles to the surface. We're like in spring now, right? And while this is all happening, you know, I'm paying attention. I'm sharing stuff to my, my Instagram stories and stuff, just trying to stay involved and stay active. That's kind of how I've always been since the beginning of time. Like since I was 18, I was tweeting like, you know what I'm saying? Just forget Republicans kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Like just I don't mess with the police. That's just kind of how I've always been. Um, and I had, it was crazy how this all happened. So like I was finishing my album. We were shooting the cover art for it. I was getting a mix and mastered. I was going to put my album out last year. And then when the George Floyd killing happened, I remember like that night was so crazy. We were shooting the cover. Well, it wasn't the night that he got killed. This was maybe like two days after. But um, the night that we were shooting the cover art for my album was the night that all the protests had uh, bubbled over and split over to Milwaukee. So we were in at Reservoir Park um, in River West and the shoot ended. I just hear like a bunch of like horns and sirens, stuff like that. It was crazy, it was like magical. Like right when the shoot ended, we were like cut, boom, commotion. We run to the edge of the hill, like what's going on? I see this giant fleet of cars, you know what I'm saying? Like going around this the, the North Avenue roundabout by that BP. Um, and, you know, you're just blown away by the energy. You're like, wow. And then in that moment too, I'm like, wow, like this is real here now. Like this is come to Milwaukee. And 
honestly, it was electrifying, man. I'm the type of dude I get charged by people. Like being a pandemic was so like heart wrenching for me. I had crazy anxiety, right? Um, because I just realized I, I'm charged by purpose. I'm charged by, I have to do something, you know, that's my Virgo coming. I got to be on something. Um, and, um, so I actually just bounce back real quick in quarantine. The way I cope was biking. Like I, that's the way I would feel like power again in myself. Right. Like I'm locked in the crib all day. I'm FaceTime with homies. I'm doing Netflix virtual watch parties. I'm just trying to do anything to stay sane. Right. Just to get through a day. And, Biking, yeah, it was a huge coping mechanism. So fast forward, right? The bike became a huge theme with the album. Um, nobody's known that yet, so I guess I'm gonna just spill it here. But like, um, that's a reoccurring theme with the project and the videos and stuff. But like cycling and just motion. But that happened. I protested for two to three days straight after that. One day it was like 90 degree heat. I was going in all day. I remember I had to come home and take a break because there was like walking past my house. And I don't know, it was just, it was such a crazy experience, man. Like I'll never forget those first three days of protesting in Milwaukee. Like it was, it was really up there, you know what I'm saying? And I saw a lot of stuff that I had to talk to my therapist about um, just because, yeah, it was just, it was just war, to be honest. It was a civil war. And um. So that happens. I'm at the LGBTQ March, which was a week later. Took a little break for myself. I was like, I need to mentally just chill out. And I, my homie, uh, Mag Rodriguez, he's a program director for Backline. He texted me this flyer of this bike ride that I did in Los Angeles. It was called Ride for Black Lives. And he was like, make it happen. That's all he said. And I looked at that text and I was like, okay, called him right away. And then we started talking and I was just like, I was like, wow, we really do need to do this in Milwaukee, you know, but like one thing that he brought to the table was just just switching it up. You know what I'm saying? Like switching up what what these the, this 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 ride or just what the energy was going to look like. And I couldn't agree more. And then from my side, I was like, we need to bring in some sort of mental health model or mission behind it. Like at that point, we were what? I think when the bike ride actually happened, I think we were maybe like 20 days into protesting. So I knew we all needed a break. And I started just reading a lot while, you know, the, the protests were happening. And some of the biggest things I was reading and learning about was like, Black people don't need to be doing anything right now. We don't have to be protesting. We don't have to be walking. We don't have to be, we don't have to be doing any of that. And it's like, the reason why we end up having to is because sometimes nobody's going to do it for us. But at the end of the day, this was really a time for, you know, white people to realize and learn more and teach each other things, right? Like I was getting DMs, people hitting me up like, so like, what can I do to support? What can I do this? And that's an easy thing for me. I can like, you know, steer you towards certain fundraisers, certain resources. But as far as, you know, me educating you, that's that's where I set that boundary up. And um, so yeah, just like that whole time period was just a lot of, it was an accumulation of a lot. I know I'm like kind of, you know, scattered with all these thoughts but to focus on the ride we book we uh, looked we planned that in eight days so like it was just a this is the this is the mission you know like I think what was cool was I got to use all my talents of event throwing in the past in Milwaukee like I've done kind of you know off the beaten path events that aren't even you know shows and it was just time and we assembled the team and um and we did it in eight days and you know we had about two 2,500 people at the first ride which was crazy and like I think the reason why we all knew it was going to do well and also do well for people was because it was just something different at that time. You know, like we're all marching every single day and that gets tiring. How about a Sunday, right? We did it on a Sunday very purposely. Sunday's always a day of relaxation and reflection, right? And, and we did it on a Sunday and we got people on wheels. And a big thing for me was I wanted to see more people of color on wheels, black people on wheels, because I've always grown up doing alternative things like in the hood, like skateboarding or like bike riding and stuff like that. And, you know, riding your bike is not that like, that's not that different for people like to live on the North side, but still it's like actually like cycling, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think that's something that black people could easily just run up. Um, anyways, that's my own little fantasy, but um, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was a powerful thing. And the biggest thing too was like, you know, I, I got Mr. New York, who was a, a well-renowned DJ in Milwaukee to DJ on top of a van and, you know, kind of 
like just bring the energy up, man. Like let's have some fun, but let's also have fun that's fueled by purpose. And really all that was, was just making our voices heard. Like that's all I wanted to do, do that day. That was my only co contribution. And after that first ride, it just caught crazy, crazy attention after like the aftermath of the ride. And then we did another one in August and now it's become a thing where we would do two more this summer. And um, it's again, just a good way for, you know, the, the, the mission statement is fighting the powers of full-time job. Like, you know, mm. take a day to relax, take a day to enjoy, but also feel in solidarity with, you know, people that look like you. And another intentional thing, the last thing I'll say about the ride was I made sure that we had black and brown people at the front. So like when we lined up at the front of the ride, I made sure that when we get these photos, that press will be taken. When we get, you know, whatever is going to be shown of this ride, I want it to look a certain way. So for people that don't, I mean, it, it, there's so many reasons, right? Like, you know, being in the back of the bus, there's, there's so much, uh, there's so many different metaphors that I had going through my head for that decision but the biggest one was so people that don't normally bike or people from the north side of the south side of Milwaukee that don't even get access to these things because those areas are set up in specific ways where there aren't many bike shops or aren't many things besides you know big box stores like you know Walmart and so on and so forth and liquor stores like we just don't get the same access so I want to inspire kids you know, to be able to, to see themselves in us. And they want to go just ride a bike, bro. Like, go get a, tell your mom, you want to go get a bike, you know? And, um, and the route on the ride too, for both of them, the first one was predominantly North side. The second one was predominantly South side. Um, and then we just touched the East side at the end, you know? And like, cause I had people texting me, you know, some of my like white friends, they was like, there was parts of Milwaukee that I had never even seen before. It was crazy. You know, it's like, I'm blown by that. I'm like, y'all just thought it was the East side and downtown, but a lot of these white people are also aren't from Milwaukee. They come from, you know, so on and so forth, wherever. And then they like, you know, stay here for college. And then they're like, oh, I like Milwaukee. I'm going to stay here. But they don't see the whole Milwaukee. So that was the mission I'm looking forward to expanding on and just trying to educate more just through visual. Mm -hmm. No, it was a super dope event. Full circle moment. Uh, I can't remember if it was at the first one or the second one. Um, but I actually uh, ran into Ed, you know, out playing with his daughter while we were uh, I think I think we were like taking a little break at the time, but I seen him and he spoke for a minute. Um, I know we got like a couple of minutes left. We we like really like two minutes, and I actually I got a meeting with the principal too. So I'm gonna try to keep it like on time. Uh, but like I do want to ask the question, right? Like if you can in one word or like one sentence. I don't want to limit it to one word. Uh, and this will be our closing question. Um, but in one word or one sentence, one phrase, how would you describe Black joy? And Ed, I do want to start with you. Uh, for me, my own personal perspective, perspective of Black joy is literally the um, congregation and happiness, like just community. Uh, I don't have a full sentence for it, but just people coming together and just being able to exist and be black, no matter what that looks like, no matter how you, you know, your blackness is your blackness and just being able to be that authentically without having to worry about being shot or you know, goofy stuff because you're black. Just living in your skin and being happy, sure. Anybody who is black joy one sentence one phrase i got you, I got you. <laughs> yeah um i'll keep it limited to a phrase as well it's not like a complete thought but it's kind of like a several others um i've been thinking a lot about black joy uh, meaning safety um the idea of feeling safe whether that's with your people your cousins your family your best friends your community it's really feeling safe and what type of feeling safety can bring. I know when I feel safe, I'm more goofy. I, I laugh more, I tend to crack more jokes like when I feel safe. So definitely safety is uh, a prerequisite to experiencing Black joy. Um, I would say an authentic and unapologetic, I know like this, the theme of this is not being a um, apologetic for who you are, but an authentic and unapologetic pride that's universal no matter where you are. You don't dim your light 
to make space for others, but you demand that sort of space that is meant for you. Like you are supposed to be in these areas. You, you know, you don't have to shrink down um, and make space for others, but you can just be prideful and in who you are and the skin that you're in, no matter where you are. Yeah. I echo everybody's uh, sentiments and the thing I could bring to the table is just black joy is important. And it's important because in film, TV, ads, whatever, black trauma is one of the most flipped soul things, you know, and people love it. And they don't even realize what they're watching. They don't realize what they're necessarily supporting. And a lot of these stories are important to tell, but even for black folk to watch black trauma, that's, it becomes all we know. So like, I want to just, so I want to see black people, you know, having the cheaper by the dozen movie or whatever, like, you know, just like, I want to see more of that. That's what I want to see. And black joy and just seeing it in photography and in film, like, like I said, it's just extremely important. I want to see a black kid with a lollipop on a swing, you know, not in the street with the chalk drawn around him, even if that is most of our reality. Um, And I, I think that, that's our time. That's our time. I normally would have like a more eloquent closing, uh, but I'm really like, I got my meeting stacked back to back. Um, I do want to say thank you all again to all of my young people on the call. I appreciate you all being tuned in, being locked in. The chat was engaging. Um, again, I know, I know y'all was asking for that freestyle, uh, but Webster X on YouTube, um, the the trailer the trailer for the Heartland film is available on Vimeo, but you can just go to Google and you search uh, the Heartland film, probably Milwaukee, um, and you'll you'll be able to see some trailers. Uh, they keep saying rapping, <laughs> um, but you know Ed is a is a is a tech alum, Miss um, Steinbach Holtz. I will get your information. I, I'm I'm gonna put you all together so uh, our our uh, spoken word club uh can engage with you uh jasmine again thank you thank you very much um but yeah i appreciate it normally i would like give folks time and like before i close the meeting out but i'm not gonna do that today uh because i gotta get out of here but again thank you all enjoy your friday get some sunshine uh thank you love y'all thank you thank you for having us y'all peace out Peace, peace, check. I love y'all.